was no poetry in my father's house. That's Billy. He's been walking with Ken for a long time. This is for you, Ken. America! 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 America. You know, when I say America, and in Chinese it means Meiguo, beautiful country. Older men with pasted hair, Oxford through the snow, icing at Brooklyn curbs. In dumpsters left the jar since New Year's Day, there are doll's heads hatcheted with corded hair, spliced by freezing temperatures, while children fog their lips at toy store windows and grip the old man's hand to steal with smiles that there is happiness hiding somewhere in the glass. I've lived long enough to understand that we are all broken toys, crumpled in our dreams of plastic, shining like china plates, where we imagine nothing breaks or cracks and disappointing falls. I'm the old man with pasted hair, who silently complies with every childhood dream, just to keep the children smiling, feeling that my days are numbered before they realize I will also fill a dumpster. Ken Siegelman was born February 17, 1946 on Staten Island. His mother abandoned him two days after she gave birth. <laughs> the horses I remember as a child seemed to prance in pain, impaled on carousels grimaced in a silent frozen scream, which made me look away while my parents strapped me in. Cautioning the foot to stirrups I, I never quite could reach. So I held the pike that ran through their shoulders, and though I heard the faintest screams, seething just above the tink of music and the monitored gears that kept the horses galloping in pain. And in the dead center was a man with greasy skin and rolled up sleeves who timed the rides by reading through a comic book that never seemed to make him laugh. Ken has spent 35 years teaching in Brooklyn, almost all of which were at Abraham Lincoln High School. His goal was to challenge and engage his students in understanding history and their place in it through critical thinking and the use of language and poetry. effort more to heal the wounds between the North and South than to tell it like it was, real-life Blacks were overlooked. And what sly, rebellious minds might have schemed to free themselves were hushed inside the silence of historians who thought it fruitful to imagine docile, older men with banjos children dancing in fancy clothes, round, fat women who never frowned as their fantasy of slavery. How does an abandoned baby, shuttled from foster home to foster home, become a celebrated and honored man? What are the odds? You're a very independent woman and caring for Ken in that way. How was that? Very difficult. It was a, a time when Ken was an active alcoholic for so many years and uh, there weren't that many programs. You, you were uh, embarrassed to talk about it. And what about his... Um, Sickness. The sickness has been very, very, very tough.
There's a certain silence which makes me certain. Everything has disappeared. More than just a new moon or a foggy July sky. When the thought of an eclipse never comes to mind, or a gun gray winter sky which fools me to believe that rain or snow is on its way. The seams along the parquet floors have also lost the faces I remember seeing as a child, even when the silence settled in, if only for a moment. It, may, it makes me think of that fear that you get when you, when you don't have that noise that you're so used to on a day-to-day -day basis. It makes me think of death. Maybe that's why I'm scared of silence. <laughs> Solid Dusty Pickup, plated Tennessee, racing with a roadside stray. I remember watching him spin out of sight, caught catching his own face mirrored red beneath the shining hubcap. That afternoon, I stopped for gas where the pickup driver talked three sandy hounds to stretching on a flat bed's mattress. Like fathers, calm a child to sleep, shaken by nightmare. By 1984, over 200 of Ken's poems had been published. And in 1994, he was awarded the prestigious John Bunzel Award for demonstrating the highest degree of scholarship, pedagogical skill, and professionalism in the social studies. When I started in the mid-80s dealing with students who were emigrants from Latin America, the former Soviet Union, and I began to notice, and this was, in, and I say the earlier, but I have to be very true, the earlier part of the immigrants from Latin America and uh, Russia and Eastern Europe, they were extraordinarily bright. And language was the only thing that stood in their way. When I was 14, I picked up my first drink of heavy, uh, heavy liquor. I remember putting it to my lips, I swear, as if it were yesterday. And the alcohol went halfway down from the shot. And I was already calculating how to get the next one. He had always felt himself an outsider, a constant reminder that he was only a replacement for Edward. I was held back by my father's arm, a yard away from Edward's grave, robbed of any fantasied brotherhood, reigned off by a family troika. I was close enough to wobble in a faint when they whimpered uncontrollably edging on hysteria. They reached out to him in a flowered space above the prickly ferns. Father told her no one was responsible. He died before the doctors they took him to had common use of penicillin. I wondered why they grabbed my wrist when I discovered photos of him on a tricycle. Plump cheek and curly haired as I imagined they thought he'd look forever in a Bay or aspirin tin wrapped in a rubber band. He had hidden pennies in a place only parents were supposed to know about. When I broke the rubber band, I feared my mother's tears would shrink her in a second death and shook to think of father's rage at breaking through a sacred seal I was never meant. To touch. People who are geniuses, as I think Ken really is, and I am sure, by the way, that a hundred years from now, people will be reading Ken Siegelman's poems when, when things that are very popular and very big today are, are long gone, because those are the things, it's like a Whitman or a Keats or a Shelley, he, he is such classic work. unresolved bastardy, this kind of fractioned into 
superficial evidence, a little like a mongrel that has one or two little traits that tie it to some pedigree that's been lost someplace in some elusive past. And I think that all my progeny is going to forget about the flutes and about the feathered headdresses and they're going to be engulfed inside of some guitar strumming around about some alien legacy. And then we're all just going to fade to see. In Korea, they got shaman that marry the souls of single men and women that die only days apart, and everybody understands. Because loneliness at any level can be the greatest cruelty of all. We brush against each other at the theater, in the trains, and in the buses, as we scurry to our apartment floors wearing our city poker faces that we hope is going to hide our fears and our disappointments. Ken Siegelman chose to live his life as an artist. His observation, his sense of truth, his use of language as a sword cut through the illusions fostered on us, often heaped upon us by lesser minds. That's the difference. That's the genius. As Einstein once said, great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. Few of us know the impact of our time here. Ken Siegelman's life and work had a profound impact on the culture of Brooklyn and the hopes of people everywhere. Ken Siegelman passed away on June 19, 2009, and we want to say thank you, Ken. The next time you're in Brooklyn, take a walk down the newly dedicated street Ken Siegelman Way.